Pleasure to welcome you to this federal conference focused on innovative strategies for European integration of the Western Balkans. The Wilson Center serves as the nation's living memorial to Woodrow Wilson. To honor this man of ideas, the nation's only president to hold a PhD, the United States Congress determined to memorialize this fascinating president with an institution for advanced research, not merely a monument of marble. Here at the Wilson Center, we bridge the worlds of scholarship and policy by bringing together thinkers and the doers, academics, policymakers, journalists, business people, and scientists in a robust dialogue on the key issues of the day. While the countries of the Western Balkans are no longer um, in the headlines, there has been a growing consensus that attention should be refocused on the region. It was announced last week that Vice President Biden will travel to the region, and the new administration has shown clear signs that it wants to strengthen the transatlantic partnership. Rather than being consumed by the soft power versus hard power distinctions that have driven uh, European and American policies apart, the new goal seems to be to engage the allies of Europe through smart power and to synthesize the various policy tools that are available to the United States, the European Union, and other international actors on the scene. There has been measurable progress in all of the countries of the Western Balkans, but there also seem to, have, to still be barriers which have been difficult to overcome. In the first panel, our distinguished panelists have been asked to address the various aspects of the comple complex European integration process. The second panel addresses the successes and failures of international policies in the countries of the Western Balkans, as well as those recalcitrant barriers to progress. The third panel in the afternoon will attempt to present the tools available to policymakers for engaging the region. Uh, we are also very pleased to welcome Jason Highland, the Director of Balkans Affairs for the, at the Department of State, who will give the lunch keynote address. Now I'll turn the, pan the floor over to our first panel and Sam Wells, who is chaired. Thank you. Thank you, Netta. Some of this group gathered a little more than two years ago in Salonika to discuss related issues. Since that time, the EU hasn't strengthened its approach to the Western Balkans very much, and the countries of the region have not necessarily improved their status in moving toward EU membership with perhaps one exception. What has happened that will have a major impact on both the countries seeking accession and on the EU members setting conditions and sometimes strengthening conditions is a global economic crisis. And one of the things that will be in the background of each of these presentations will be who can now deal with both the economic issues on their plate and the thought of enlarging the European Union or accepting substantial restructuring of domestic economic and legal requirements in order to uh, advance toward accession. So we have a very good panel. Each of our four speakers will speak about 15 minutes, and uh, my role is minimally to make sure that we have time left for discussion. So our first presentation will be from Wade Jacoby of Brigham Young University, who is also a Ferdinand Brodell Senior Fellow at the European University Institute in the hardship post of Florence. Thank you, Wade. Well, thanks very much, Sam. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I, I think in a conference on innovative strategies in the West Balkans, uh, NIDA's decision to lead off with someone who's not a specialist on the Western Balkans is, uh, well, <laughs> innovative. Uh, but I will uh, try to, um, to talk about the EU en <clears throat> enlargement process more generally as kind of a prelude to a lot of the more specialty talks that will be given later. Um, to explain broadly how enlargement works from the EU perspective and do so with reference not just to the current ongoing uh, Western Balkans issues, but to the 2004-2007 enlargements as well. First thing to say about the EU, though it's had various names over various times, it's been around since 1957, at which point there were six founding member states, and now there are 27. So that already tells you something interesting. The organization keeps adding new members, first in the early 1970s with the UK, Denmark, and Ireland, Later in the early and in the mid-80s with states that were transiting out of authoritarian governments in Spain, Portugal, and Greece, 
in uh, the mid-90s with uh, what's called the Nordic enlargement often, but there was Austria in there as well. And then finally, uh, more recently in 2004 with 10 new countries and 2007 with Bulgaria and Romania. Now, EU officials will always tell you we have no interest in seeing the entire map of Europe colored the EU color. Uh, and, um, but when you look at the map, you can sort of be forgiven for being skeptical about this. To the north and to the west and to the south, it seems that only salt water can stop the European Union. Uh, although if you look more closely, Norway and Switzerland are not in there. But to the east, of course, there's no salt water. And the question has for a long time been, where does the European Union end? Um, now, it's true that um, the sort of alphabet soup of other European organizations has led to organizations with more than 27 member states. The Council of Europe, not to be confused with the European Council, which is a EU, EU organization. The Council of Europe in Strasbourg uh, has 47 uh, member states. The OSCE has 56, including the United States and Canada. The EU has known for a long time that it can't take everybody in, that it does many more things than the OSCE does, and that it would not be able to function with that many members. So who gets a chance to join? In recent years, this debate has really revolved around two questions. First, can the state that wants to join do the things, the many things an EU member state must do? Two, even if it could, can the EU also function with another state or states added to the existing mix? Only if both questions can be answered yes, can enlargement really go forward. And the tricky thing is that because the EU is based on treaties negotiated between sovereign states, uh, it can only enlarge if all of the current member states say yes to an enlargement. And sometimes states choose to block enlargement. Now one question about the Balkans that we hear a lot about is the Slovenia-Croatia situation. Um, and Slovenia, already a member of the EU, will have to be satisfied in its border disputes with Croatia in order for things to go forward. It's a sort of fundamental uh, legal point that you have to bear in mind. There'll be a lot of other examples that come out in the course of the workshop. Going forward past the Western Balkans, uh, some of uh, whom were promised membership in 2003, no one can really tell you uh, who will join and when. This is essentially an unknowable question. The European Union has a provision that any European state can apply. We don't know where Europe ends. You can hear some of the traditional ambivalence in the following statement by the European Commission from 1992, going back all, already more than 15 years. The term European is not beneficially defined. It combines geographical, historical, and cultural elements which all contribute to European identity. The shared experience of proximity, ideas, values, and historical interaction cannot be condensed into a simple formula and is subject to review by each <coughs> succeeding generation. Talk about kicking the can down the road. We don't know exactly who a European is. We'll always have to ask that question. So the final frontiers of Europe will not be decided now uh, for at least three reasons. First, it's not rational to do so now when we don't know what kind of other relationships besides membership might be productive for these countries and for the European Union. Second, it's not possible, as I've already alluded, member states in the EU today disagree over who ought to be allowed in and couldn't solve that agreement, solve that disagreement right now, if forced to. And third, it's not wise, since when you make a list of who will get in, you're essentially telling the people, telling some countries, relax, you'll never make it. And other countries, relax, you'll make it. And neither message really motivates states to undertake the difficult reforms the EU would like to see them take, even those who may not make it a members for a very long time, if ever. And so here we come to a second issue I want to discuss, which is the EU's ability to keep non-member states, but hopeful member states, interested and actively reforming in order to make that membership option plausible. For a variety of reasons now, you'll hear today that the most plausible candidates for EU membership would include the six states of the Western Balkans, plus Kosovo if that's a state, Turkey, and if they want to, the so-called EFTA states, Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, which have long and close associations with the EU, have often sort of played footsies with the EU, but have never uh, uh, gone all the way to membership. Now, as I said, enlargement's a complicated process, but this process, I think, can be boiled down to four basic steps, which I call association, application, negotiation, and ratification. Let me just run through this very quickly. Association. 
a European country expresses interest in membership and engages in what are called association agreements. They have different names in different phases. These association agreements you want to understand as a kind of trial period in which a state can begin to get familiar with European Union processes and understand what it's getting itself into. It also generally gets some special aid and trade uh, uh, consideration during this period. And this leads to the second period, the application period. After some time in these association agreements, usually several years, the state formally applies to the EU for membership. The so-called European Commission writes a recommendation to the European Council, and the Council decides whether to open uh, the process with the so-called candidate country. And historically, the Council always does what the Commission says, recommends uh, with one uh, exception. Um, the third phase is the negotiation. When these negotiations then begin at the Council's decision, uh, so does a process called screening. Now this consists of EU Commission officials, this is the administrative executive arm of the European Union, sitting down with representatives of the ministries, in the US we call these departments, of various specialized functional um, ministries of uh, 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 the candidate country and comparing their existing laws with what the European Union demands in that area. So depending on how you count the legal accumulation of the European Union, which has this French name, the acquis communautaire, you may have run across this, has something like 80,000 pages of laws, regulations, treaties, court decisions. All of this stuff ultimately has to be swallowed and digested by the candidate country. And screening is a chance for the, the experts to sit with the experts and see, sort of make a to-do list, a task list of what is to be done. It's broken down these 80,000 pages into 30-some chapters. And their chapters, the chapters are arranged such that the commission experts on transport can sit down with the people from the transportation ministries uh, of the respective candidate countries and hash this all out. Then the internal market people and the telecom people and the environment people all do the same with their respective counterparts. And so on down the line through, as I said, 35 chapters uh, now. The point is that screening is meant to do two things. Educate the candidate country on what's expected of them and to help them formulate concrete plans to meet these expectations. The fourth stage then is, is uh, ratification. Once these, these negotiations that I spoke about in step three, the only thing being negotiated is when and how the candidate country will do what is required of them. And the only thing they can really negotiate are certain transitional periods phasing in and phasing out certain practices. Um, once these negotiations are all closed, the country signs a so-called accession treaty which then has to be rat ratified by every member state of the European Union plus the European Parliament just to raise the degree of difficulty a bit higher. Once the ratifications are done, they're in the club. So those are the four steps. Now, one of the most interesting and unusual parts of the enlargement process is this thing called screening. And I think this is really the guts of the negotiation process. And I follow this very carefully for a book I wrote on NATO and EU enlargement in 2004. And then and now, screening was essentially designed to force the national ministerial authorities in the candidate countries uh, to, to spell out and confront, deal with the gap between what they have today and what they would need to have. In many areas, that gap appeared to be quite sizable. So the candidate countries needed to make a lot of changes. And how did screening work to, to get them to confront these changes? I think if you'll allow me an impertinent analogy, screening looked a lot like religious confession to a member of the clergy. Uh, so as a result, I call this analogy the priest and the penitent. The analogy turns on two basic uh, similarities between confession in private life and EU screening. The first is that the starting point is self-revelation. Self-revelation about the inadequacies and shortcomings. You have to tell the priest what you've been doing wrong. Um, and if you are one of these post-communist countries, let's just say that the EU figured you'd been doing a lot of things wrong. Remember, you just come out of 40, 50 years of, of the communist system. Uh, and, and so now the EU has some sense of what you might have been doing that they wouldn't like, that wouldn't be compatible with EU practices. They're not blind to the kind of policies that prevail in Central and Eastern Europe 
But even though they have a lot of sectoral experts, they don't really know, particularly because in 2004 there were 10 countries in line, and now there are quite a few, as, as noted, countries in line for membership. It's a very complicated thing. So the task forces of the European Union have some information, but they do rely on this sort of self-revelation process to a certain extent. They need key data from inside the candidate countries, and they need the candidate countries to cooperate with this. Okay, so that's the first part of the analogy. The second part of the analogy is that the priests who hear the confession, the European Commission, uh, feel the right, indeed the obligation, to impose responsibilities on the penitent, to remedy weaknesses. They need to make sure that whatever they're doing wrong turns out to be relatively short-term misdeeds and not a kind of pattern of institutionalized uh, misbehavior. So the commission tries to make clear their low tolerance for noncompliance, which has to be fully and completely implemented not after they become members, but before they can sign the, the accession treaty. Um, at the same time, however, the commission is trying to emphasize that, say in 2004, um, you are all states that are ultimately uh, very much on our radar, unlike, say, Russia, right? So there's very much a kind of hate the sin, love the sinner kind of thing going on in 2004. Uh, okay, so I think that most of the observers of the 2004 and 2007 enlargements um, are broadly optimistic about how these states are doing as a consequence of the screening process. And I want to be clear that I'm confining my remarks here to the administrative rule-following side. As Nida says, there's, and, and Sam underscored too, there's a lot going on on the economy side that has these countries in very, very serious difficulties. But in terms of rule-following, the, the 2004 member states are actually following the rules of the European Union, transposing the legislation at a higher, not a lower rate, than the old member states of the European Union. And when they're caught doing something that's contrary to the rules, they're actually somewhat quicker to resolve these situations uh, than are the old member states. Now that just speaks to the sort of rules on paper side of things, but there's additional, really fine additional data coming out now that shows that even at the kind of behavioral level, for example, some of these states have done extraordinarily well. So. Um, there's a study that looks at the question, you know, there's all this debate about foreign aid. Does foreign aid distort and make it impossible, basically, um, for, the, for the organizations that receive foreign aid uh, to work effectively with it? And it turns out that the organizations in Central Europe that received EU aid are more and not less connected to other organizations, local government, civil society, businesses, uh, than, than were the or similar organizations who did not receive European Union aid. So there are some c cautious reasons for optimism about the results of this in the 2004 uh, enlargement in particular. I think 2007, that's a scarier story. Now, this is not to say that all is rosy in the region. Um, there are several ways in which the Commission looking back at, and here I come more to the theme of this conference, looking back at the 2004 and 2007 enlargement, tried to think, what could we have done better? Where could we improve? Let me mention three things in particular. First, I think particularly with Bulgaria and Romania, there's a sense in the commission that screening did not really get at some very important political issues, especially surrounding corruption and the rule of law. A lot of people in the commission today will tell you that they weren't specific, they'll say we weren't specific enough on rule of law questions and corruption. And we delayed talking about these things because it wasn't an official chapter of screening until too late in the game, at a time when it was, would have been incredibly politically sensitive to then bring up corruption issues which take long time to address. And so we tended to sort of, at critical moments, close our eyes and dream of England, to imagine that everything will be okay. Uh, and we need to fix that. And so this time around, they've talked a lot about trying to have a dedicated chapter on rule of law as part of the screening. Um, so some big sins got ignored in the 2007 enlargement in particular, and, and it, it's hurt. A second lesson was that in this earlier phase of enlargement, the commission often found that it opened negotiations too soon. Um, it sat down to negotiate before the country had made any real progress in the so-called chapter. And the usual pattern then was promises. The country would say they would build these elaborate harmonograms, they call them, I'm not making this up, grand 
organizational schemes of how they would get from point A to point B, how the little acorn would become the giant oak. And then once that plan was passed, then uh, not much happened for quite a while until relatively late in the game. And then as the negotiation chapter was meant to be closed, uh, there would be a lot of scrambling to try to patch the most obvious defects. And, and this time, what they've started to do is, is try to avoid uh, the situation in which there's a kind of appearance of conformity and instead put benchmarks into the process for even opening the negotiation chapter. So now the commission is trying to resist opening negotiations on a particular chapter until the candidate country can show that it's made a kind of good faith effort to get relatively close. The third innovation is that, as mentioned above, um, sometimes these candidate countries were a little reluctant to uh, admit to the commission all the many things that might be going wrong in their jurisdictions. Now. I don't think this will be a huge revelation in Washington, D.C., that there are times when political leaders and state officials may not wish to reveal their own shortcomings, uh, especially on paper. Um, but when problems arise in this uh, vein, the EU member states would then blast the commission for not doing careful enough homework, for not inspecting enough um, what had been said to them. And so this time around, the commission has come up with something it calls peer groups, so the commission reached into the member states, the old member states, who were their toughest critics, and said, if you don't think we're doing a good enough job inspecting, why don't you come out with us into the field and we'll go together? And so these peer groups have been used around the Western Balkans. So the commission isn't trying to monitor all on its own. So in laying out these alternative mechanisms, and there's several, several others I could discuss and I think will come up today, I'm not saying that all three of these new things work, but I'm just trying to make this incredibly Byzantine European Union enlargement process a little more comprehensible. It's a very difficult thing for them to simply say, I mean, sometimes in the States we get an impression, you know, look, the first round of enlargement worked pretty well. You delivered a lot of stability to the region. Why not just do it again? Why not just hurry up and get these folks inside? And the one answer to that is that it was actually quite a complex process in 2004. It took several years to make it work. And if it worked well, arguably some of the things that worked well required that patience and adjustment and information gathering and, yes, um, some real coercion sometimes to get people to do things. And the, 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 the jobs today are, are argu arguably even tougher. Um, the countries in 2004 had not really fought recent wars with one another, did not have really, really unresolved ethnic disputes that grew directly out of those wars, did, did not have the kind of deep ambivalence about the European Union in their populations that are present in countries like Serbia uh, today. There are exceptions. Albanians love the European Union beyond all reason. No one loves the EU more than Albanians do. But for the most part, there's a lot of ambivalence in the region about the European Union. Uh, and of course, the EU has its own problems. It's failed twice to reform itself through the treaty process and deliver a set of rules that, that can make it, it, it work better. And so you've got really weird things on the horizon, like here's something that could really happen. Uh, under the current rules, Germany would have one commissioner, and it's at least thinkable that the former Yugoslav states could have collectively seven. That's quite an odd thing. So one thing is sure, there's plenty to talk about today. I hope some of these practical matters that I've gone through here, while not necessarily very sexy, can get us started off with some common conceptual ground. And uh, I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thanks very much. Thank you, Wade. Our next presentation is by Giannis Sarbatsoglu, who is with the SECI Pro and is currently a scholar with our th Southeast Europe project. Uh, Giannis will talk about from SECI to RCC the impact of regional initiatives on stability in the Western Balkans. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'm sorry to say mine will be a bit more technical and not as much fun, but <laughs> let's see how this goes. What I thought of doing today is uh, try to see some of the lessons learned from the CE development efforts. Um, and then f see how those might be applied in a Western Balkan framework. 
Now, just as a background to understand how this worked, uh, I've listed here some, not all, of the initiatives targeted to the region in the past years. Uh, starting chronologically with the Central uh, European Initiative, which was, I say, Italian-Austrian-led, the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, the Rayamon process, the Southeastern European Cooperative process, the Southeastern, Coop uh, Southeastern European Cooperative Initiative, the Stability Pact, which you all know, the Stabilization Association process and SAPs, I can take back and link them to the Rayamon process, the Southeast European Initiative, which is military in one sense, and then now the Regional Cooperation Council, which is uh, what inherited the Stability Pact framework. Now, that plus over 20 bilateral efforts from state to state, um, plus other international organizations operating in the ground. Now, one can start this and go into detail about what are the costs of coordinating, of not coordinating, of competing, for who's going to fund what, but... Uh, um, for our speech, I'm just going to, for our talk, I'm just going to focus on uh, how di did it all work out in relation to cooperating with each other. Now, everybody after the conflict wanted to help. So you have the World Bank, the UN, the US, the EU, all the initiatives I've mentioned. Now, and everybody in every development effort will always say, well, we don't want to duplicate. We need to cooperate so we make best use of the funds available. Uh, now, immediately after the conflict, the, the focus was on pressing political and ethnic problems. And I'm going to use SECI, which I know better, and I'm working on details on it while here at the center, uh, to see aspects of its execution that I perceive as best practice. Now, the first step in approaching this is, uh, the fundamental question is, um, you address the recipient states and say, well, we are here to help, and uh, we have a regional approach for this. And immediately, the question is, who belongs here? Who are we here to help? And I'm using Croatia, Slovenia, and Moldova as good examples of how this went about in 96. Now, when Seki approached uh, the states, the targeted states, with its grandiose idea, there were two states immediately, Croatia and Slovenia, that said, uh, this is a Balkan-oriented project. We're not Balkan states. We're Central European states. We don't want to be here. Okay. And then you had Moldova. And Moldova is even more strange because the donors themselves could not, uh, could not place in a certain category. So, for example, for a period of time, the United States had Moldova in what was at the, or more recently also known as the Guam. So it was linked to something north of it. And then others within the U.S. government viewed it as part of Southeastern Europe. That might sound irrelevantly technical, but it's not because the, where the, your funding comes from and, and in what conceptual framework you are placed in is it has to do a lot with uh, how you are viewed from the outside. The, th the second question is why should we, do, we be talking to each other? Why should we do it in independently in the sense that, okay, the U.S. wants to fund us or the EU, uh, why don't we do it EU-Romania, uh, U.S.-Romania? Why do I have to play within this regional structure discussion? And then the fundamental question that is, I think applies everywhere in every region is who is in control? Okay, so with, the, with SECI, the perception was that it was a U.S.-led initiative. And it, that obviously it's important who is in control because you decide within your national capital how much am I going to really play with them. Now, SECI decided to structure its effort uh, unusually, I would think. Now, they, they wanted to sell what everybody um, in most development projects starts with, which is the key phrase which is called regional ownership. Now, everybody talks about it, but it's an elusive concept. So what, what, what does that actually mean? Seki tried it. Uh, at, the, at, the, at the time, it was even difficult for the press to be understood. I'm looking at transcripts from the, foundation, from the creation of Seki in 1996, and Ambassador Sifter at the time is giving an interview in, in, in Geneva. So he's explaining the agenda committee, and he's explaining how you have all these participating states who are going to sit around the table and we're going to call this meeting the agenda committee and then the US and EU are observer states and cannot vote in the process. Now if you look at the transcript, journalists repeat, repeatedly ask the question, does the US have voting power? And Sifter comes back and says, no they don't. And then they, he gets the same question again and again because it cannot be understood that it is possible to structure the agenda committee without the U.S. or major EU states or the EU itself to have an actual role in it. Now, the second innovative aspect of this, uh, what 
which is what they call the Business Advisory Council. Now, they knew at the time that, and I think uh, the previous speaker mentioned it also, is that uh, it's difficult for politicians to come out and say, yes, we have problems in this region or in this area or in this sector. So uh, they were thinking of, of a reality check mechanism, and that was the Business Advisory Council. Now, what they did is they went to a very big and successful Turkish businessman, Rahmi Koch, which I hope most of you are familiar with, and uh, a, a counterpart in Greece, which are states where are known in the area that don't, do not get along in a variety of issues, and said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to have these two businessmen, and then businessmen from, this, from the region, and the caveat was that you cannot be a CEO or you cannot be a high-level manager. You have to own the company if you're going to participate. Uh, once you own the company, that means you're important within your state. Uh, so politicians might fear you or you want, you want your money in the upcoming campaign. But what they thought, saw the Business Advisory Council as a mechanism is a mechanism that will uh, provide a reality check for the Business Advisory Council, for the Agenda Committee. So when the, the ministers met and said, we have no transport issues, uh, the Business Advisory Council will come in and say, well, yeah, but you have 32-hour waiting times in border X and border Y. Now, the balance here is an awkward balance for the targeted states because we're talking about a public-private interaction. Public-private partnerships and interactions are difficult in any state. Um, we had, at the time, brought people uh, in the El Paso border crossing in the U.S. to show them how the U.S. chamber was talking to U.S. customs about problems they were facing. And this was an exercise they've done repeatedly in the U.S., and it's still a very difficult process. No civil servant likes to sit in front of a table and listen to people telling them, telling them how they do their job wrong or how they are not efficient. So you can imagine people coming out of a Soviet tradition that rather was unthinkable, uh, how they would engage in this process. Now, I've talked about the U.S. and EU, and I don't want to take a lot of time because I want to go to the Western Balkans. Now, where to start? Uh, everybody talks to, wants to talk about democratization, human rights, political stability, but uh, Seki, and I, I really think, and time has shown, I will show you results in a little, will, in a little while, uh, approach is totally technical. So where do you want to start? You want to start, start with trade and transport. Why? Because chances are you're not going to find a lot of disagreement about it. So uh, conditions at the time in 97 were worse than ever. So it was easier to, to pass with a truck through the targeted states during communist times than it was then. And let me bring a small example. I don't want to take a lot of the time. Uh, um, you had border crossings where border, where border agencies had a lunch break. Uh, so it was one hour, let's say from 12 to 1. But there was a time difference from state to state. Uh, so what in reality happened, you had a two-hour break because everybody had a 12 to 1 break but it was 12 to 1 in my clock and then 1 to 2. So the first step was, could you align your time breaks? Uh, um, and I can bring a lot of examples like that. Uh, borders are extremely interesting places because they are, they are mirror images of the cooperation of ministries from the capital city because you have everybody at the border. You have uh, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Transport. Everybody wants to play and everybody wants to keep their own... Uh, they're on separate accounts, let's say. The second thing that, uh, that Seki tried at the time was, you're collecting all this money at the border. That's fine. We're not going to intervene. Could you envision collecting them from one window? I mean, the same amount, and they would be distributed equally or what you charged before uh, among the ministries. This sounds very, very simple. You had immediate agreement at the ministerial level, and in some cases, it took, it took over four years for it to be established. And why? Because ministers could not decide which ministry would control the single window. Uh, now, at the time, you had obviously everybody talk about serious infrastructure issues. So what you want to do is you want to build big highways, you want to build bridges. Obviously, there is a lot of interest in it. One, because there is a lot of money involved. Uh, so the World Bank might come and say, well, we're going to have this big bridge project. And I think it, it says a lot about the way things work also. If I was working for the bank or the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development or any of these big groups coming into fund, as, as an officer of the bank, I look good when I have successfully big projects, 300 million, 400 million. I mean, I advance my own career, and I also get to engage with big players because we're talking about a lot of money. Uh, and then the locals like it because uh, 
there's going to be a lot of money coming, so we're going to have our companies working for it, but also multinationals like it because they get to build a bridge. Uh, so everybody likes it, but uh, what does that actually give? Now, at the time, um, the U.S. and the EU um, cooperated, and that's extremely important. I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to this in a little while, and set custom, custom, customs officers to do measurements on the ground. So in reality, the time that it took for you to move goods around would not really be diminished if you had a six-lane highway that was empty. Because all of your time you spend at the border. So irrelevant of the infrastructure, I mean, you would not gain anything, but I, I'm not saying that you didn't want the infrastructure. I'm just saying that you wouldn't resolve any of your immediate problems. Um, now, OK, I don't want to go into the technical details. Uh, of how you get state agencies to work together and how do you get the private sector to get true representation. Don't forget that uh, the issue that interests me more in my work in the center in these days is the private sector representation. Most of these countries, even today, will, f will have an umbrella organization called the National Chamber of Commerce. And all the, uh, the associations, the freight forward association, the transport association, will fall under the chamber and then the chamber will act as their representative. Now, in most cases, I would say almost all, at the time, there were substantial changes have been made. The chamber was not truly a representative body. The president of the chamber was almost a political appointment. They say they had elections, but they, they had amazing communist-like elections where the president would get elected with 97 or 98 percent of the people that were voted for. So uh, the immediate problem is uh, who's going to talk on our behalf? And I will come back to this because today with the RCC, we are facing a similar problem with the Regional Cooperation Council. Um, now, one of the concrete projects, and I will link that uh, with uh, the deliverables, was a World Bank project called the Trade and Transport Facilitation Project in Southeastern Europe. It was around, if I'm not mistaken, around 240 to 250 million. And uh, a small percentage of that, 4 million, was given um, uh, to locals to execute. Uh, how was the origin? I mean, the U.S. was funding a proportion, a part of it. So how are you going to go about it the usual way? You're going to provide it to the arm created by the U.S. government to, to handle this money, USAID. Uh, and then that, the USAID will, will tender it uh, to one of the five, six uh, um, consulting companies that can undertake this role. At the time, um, Anthony Lake, um, I don't know why, uh, paid a particular interest to the subject and said, well, with Sifter and others, the then director of the FBI, Free, said, well, let's try to do it a different way. So they found a, a, another bureau within state called the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, and they diverted money from aid, which did not make a lot of people happy, as you would understand, and tried to execute it, finding local partners to do it. And they picked a Greek, Turkish, and Bulgarian structure to execute this. Now, this, was a, this is a recipe for disaster, okay? Because what you do, actually, is you try to use a contractor uh, because you want to warm relationships among these bodies, but the contractor might lose focus on the actual execution of the project. And then, do they actually have the technical expertise to do it? Wouldn't it be better if we bring someone from D.C. or London to head this? In reality, no. Uh, the bank, and I'm, uh, I'm not going to go into this a lot, but what I have is the Albanian poster for this, and the, the, the regional ownership aspect of it, this is the Ministry of Economy of Albania talking about their project. They have the money they're executing, and I have two pictures out of many. The top picture is from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and it's an experiment they did, uh, which actually having Bosnia and customs officials and the actual enemy, which are the users of the service, taking joint seminars together. Okay? And then the picture underneath, which you cannot see well, is another Bosnian experiment, which is, let me use Bosnian Muslim trainers in Republika Srpska to do my training. And it, amazingly, I don't know how, it worked. Uh, this was all technical. There was no other discussion as what is the International Road Union in, in Geneva, and what is FIATA in Zurich, and how can you get certifications so other people who think you are respectable so you can do business. Now, public outreach, and I'm going to go fast now, was extremely important. There is no more important thing, in my view, than telling people within your country, through your own newspapers, of what actually is taking place. And everybody wants to do it if the results are good. So in a very brief period of time, you had 154 articles and publications, TV broadcasts on a transport issue. I mean, if you, 
you were talking about a sexy issue before. If there is a topic that is not really interesting, it's transport. I mean, who really cares? So, uh, and 36 radio broadcasts. Now, last, and I won't bother you anymore with it, a very important aspect of execution here. What is easier for consultants to do? I get, I have to train 2,000 customs experts in Bosnia. Well, what do I do? I go to Sarajevo at the Holiday Inn, which many that have dealt with the region have stayed at the hotel, okay? And I execute in Sarajevo. Why the hell would I want to go anywhere else? Well, in reality, the, it's absolutely evident that the returns you do when you diversify your target cities or your target areas of training uh, are geometrically greater. Uh, there was an insistence um, by the Department of State at the time uh, that you, you don't do it in capital cities. You don't go to Sofia, you don't go to Bucharest, go somewhere else. And the effect, there is a multiplier effect in this. One is, you're gonna go to these local chambers in Ruse, okay? Now, the, the big people in Bucharest know that the people in Ruse might not actually have the capacity, but they don't wanna be embarrassed. So th they are forced themselves to provide capacity to the local chamber. And then you don't force people in Russia to travel to Bucharest, which is a long drive, uh, to do this technical training to be certified. Uh, it provided extra capacity for the local chamber and at the same time allowed people at the periphery to feel that they're important, that people actually care that they're there. Now, just few results and I'm gonna go fast. These are from the World Bank in 2005. Within four years, you had a border crossing time reduction of 65%. Uh, an increased trade volume plus 46, and then the custom revenue collected, this is the most important one, at 81%. Usually you have a big opposition from the Ministry of Economy where customs usually belong, says, what are you people doing here? We are collecting money for the state. Uh, you are proposing changes that might decrease that amount of money, and it, they relate also to security. This is not our topic, but I think it's important to mention. At the time, the, the, the logic uh, in customs and in border police was, 100% check. We check everything. That was the Soviet logic. Okay. Anything that passed through the border, we check. And a lot of the Western experts that came in and say, why don't you try selectivity? And what you might get is if you target the right people and you spend more than two minutes checking them, you might get more returns. And we can say clearly today that uh, this has been proven in the region. Now, why did it work? Okay. Now, one is the regional approach, and I cannot ever emphasize the value of regional approach. Uh, the immediate, uh, in, in my mind at least, the, the, the immediate uh, tool you can use is look at your neighbor and how your neighbor is doing it better. You're all in the same program. This is not a bilateral effort. Oh, look how the Bulgarians are so much faster in adapting this. Um, the second is, at, at the time we were talking, was U.S. commitment. And I, I will say this and stress this. It's not the money. It's the political presence. What we've seen in 2006, where priorities for the U.S. government had changed, is there was no need for money. But you had a lot of the U.S. ambassadors in the region, one asked saying, well, we've completed our work here on this sector, and we're moving to other areas of interest, the stands at the time. Okay. Now, what I have always said is there is no need to say this. Nobody's asking for more money, but there is always value of actually presenting a picture where We've done considerable work. We're not intending to have increased financial commitments for the region, but we definitely have an interest and we're watching what's going on. None of the U.S. money, which were tiny in comparison to, to what the bank was giving. I mean, four million out of the 270, I mean, it's nothing. But, and nobody was asking for more, but there's definitely value of having the U.S. saying that it has a presence and it's just monitoring. What we got after 2006, 2007 was uh, work is done here, what a wonderful work we have done. We're shifting our attention somewhere else. Now, the regionally owned, I don't want to talk about uh, in, in, in depth, I think there is a evident value of having the people receiving the aid feeling that this is their project. Fly under the radar. I cannot overemphasize this. You will always have political issues, and I'm glad you mentioned Slovenia and Croatia. Oh, sorry, I'm going very fast then. Uh, because uh, it's a perfect example. I mean, Croatia has been doing the work, Croatia is ready, and here you have an issue where its accession is blocked for, what, 30 meters of water? And if I was Croatian, I would think, why would I give land for accession? It makes no sense. Uh, but you will, and I'm taking the smallest possible. Now, looking at the Western Balkans today, okay, now obviously you have the EU dream forward, 
and the, uh, you talked about uh, disagreement within the EU, and I think it's very important. I'm putting my Greek hat on, and I'm just going to say, as a Greek, uh, I will fight for that accession until the end. I gained minimally when the Baltic states got in. What did Greece gain with Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia joining? Did anybody ask us? No. And I would go as far as say, what did I gain when Poland entered the Union? I want my neighbors to get in, and this is a conflict that is coming. I mean, why isn't Albania part of Europe more than it is uh, Lithuania? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I understand the problems that were faced by the large uh, uh, accession process and uh, the current economic problems. Now, let me go to the specific. SEFTA was one of the most successful efforts undertaken by the Stability Pact. If you don't know what it is, a free trade association signed among its members. Now, this was a piece of paper, and now they're dealing with non-tariff barriers. And the question is, the OECD has come in and said, we need to, to have an understanding of what these non-tariff barriers are in the Western Balkans. And what we are suggesting to the RCC, to the Regional Cooperation Council based in Sarajevo, is that we're going to send our consultants per state, we're going to use this large amount of money, to try to see what the NTBs are. Now, what are the local suggestions? The local suggestions is, why don't you let the chambers, with your supervision, do it locally so it's ours? And we have a battle, as we discuss right now, and will be discussed on May 20th, um, of how this is going to be done. I mean, it's absolutely clear in my mind how it should be. There is obviously a more difficult process of not using the Paris consultant and going locally, but the benefit of going locally, even in Tirana, where I know the chamber well, and I will not characterize it as the best chamber in the world, uh, outweigh any possible short-term benefit of using a British, French, or German, or American consultant flying from Paris to Tirana to do their measurements. Now, I will end with this. Uh, there is a definite value in thinking small. Think small. You will always have this big, the cost of a problem, is BIH sustainable in the future, the Macedonian issue, or a hundred other issues that might prop up. But uh, in high politics, we'll always have the possibility of derailing the process, the Croatian Slovenia example. But if you do small and concrete and provide deliverables to the everyday person, you have the possibility of changing people's outlook. And that's the only thing that counts. You're not going to force through some legal structure or some threat. You're not going to force me to like my neighbor. If I don't like my neighbor, I don't like my neighbor. And that's it. You're not going to legally make me like my neighbor. You might, through deliverables, get me to understand that there is benefit for me working well with my neighbor because we all gain. But I cannot be forced to like my neighbors. Sorry if I went over time, Sam. Thank you very much. <laughs> you packed a lot in, so that's, that's very useful to have that. Our next presentation is by Gulner Ibet of the University of Kent, who is also currently a scholar with our Southeast Europe project. Uh, Gulner will speak on the roles of NATO in the EU in state building in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you. Um, my presentation is going to oops, narrow things down a bit um, because I'm going to specifically focus on uh, the case of Bosnia uh, and the case of NATO and EU conditionality in state building. Um, this uh, focus, you're going to probably wondering why this particular focus on Bosnia. Uh, what I'm presenting today is part of a larger British Academy funded project that I'm doing at the University of Kent, which has almost come to a close. And in uh, this project, we run a couple of workshops, three of them, where we explored these issues uh, on the roles of NATO and EU in, in state building. And we discovered this uh, in the discussions, uh, two very different approaches, um, state building on one hand and member state building on the other, which is more close to this role of uh, European integration. Uh, Bosnia is a very good example to study the difference between state building on one hand and member state building on the other, uh, because um, External state building uh, is a very integral part of the Dayton Peace Accords, where, which gives the international organizations in charge of implementing Dayton powers which supersede any other kind of external top-down intervention. This is best exemplified, as you know, with the bond powers of the Office of the High Representative, who has the power to dismiss uh, uh, officials and impose laws. So uh, although these bond powers have been 
gradually phased out, uh, Bosnia nevertheless has suffered setbacks since the 10th anniversary of Dayton. Uh, firstly, with the uh, failure of the constitutional reforms in 2006, uh, followed by the electoral victories of Milorad Dodik in the uh, Republic of Srpska, and then uh, Haris Lajdic's success in snatching the Bosniak vote in the Federation. And while Dodik's electoral success uh, rested much on undoing the state-building exercise of the late 1990s, uh, Slidic has also promised the undoing of Dayton and the Serb Republic. So there is this uh, sort of, there's definitely not a coherent vision about what is the nature of the Bosnian state. However, the role of personalities have not just been important uh, among local politicians, but also among the international community. There have been inconsistencies uh, in the OHR. Uh, for example, the laissez-faire approach of Paddy Ashdown's success for uh, Christian Schwartz Schilling uh, compared to Ashdown's much more interventionist approach uh, has actually led to sort of perception uh, among the local elites of inconsistencies in this top-down imposition of state building. So how do we move away from this top-down imposition of state building, which is already perceived as quite incoherent, uh, and given the current political crisis in the country, to member state building. Uh, the member state building uh, is basically to do with the power or using the tools of conditionality, which is basically the increased leverage used by institutions like the EU and NATO um, to have a more advisory capacity uh, inducing domestic state building through laying conditions for future membership rather than top-down imposition through the Dayton framework. Um, this uh, has come about largely from the uh, Venice Commission report in 2005, which saw the reduction of the interventionist role of external actors as uh, the only way for creating effective uh, domestic institutions. However, there's also a dilemma here because uh, much of the international intervention, in particular the role of the AHR, OHR, can only seize when domestic institutions are strong enough. On the other hand, domestic institutions can only be strong enough once the uh, distortions of external intervention are involved. So this dilemma, unfortunately, does continue in Bosnia. Now, as I said, our research particularly focused on the roles of uh, NATO and the EU in getting from this process, which is sometimes misleadingly called from Dayton to Brussels, in other words, from state building to member state building through conditionality. And we focus specifically on uh, police reform and defense reform. So I'm going to now talk briefly about uh, what were the, um, the successes and failures and pitfalls with regards to uh, police reform and, and defense reform. And I'll start off with talking a little bit about the EU police reform. Now, the EU took over the police reform exercise from the UN. Um, the International Police Task Force, which was run under the UN uh, at the end of the war after the, uh, after the Dayton Agreement was in force. Um, the IPTF had limited enforcement mechanisms and was actually played by logistical and professional problems. So this was actually the mission that the EU inherited. And uh, the uh, high representative at the time, Paddy Ashdown, established a police structuring commission to draft a strategy for the uh, reforming of the police forces. Uh, thus, the first steps towards reforming the police were not taken by the EU nor by the Bosnian actors, but by the OHR. So it was very much top-down state building, had nothing to do with member state building. Now, the way it moved towards member state building, building was with the involvement, gradual involvement of the EU. Uh, however, the Police Reform Commission was unable to arrive at a mutually acceptable compromise for reforming the police forces, uh, where, which the uh, Bosnian Serb leadership rejected uh, the reform package completely. And the final proposal of the commission, the Police Reform Commission, was to abolish the entity and cantonal police forces and to establish a police force decentralized to local police areas. Um, according to the report, the control over the police would be transferred from the cantons and entities to the state level. So the idea was to uh, strengthen state level institutions in Bosnia through police reform. Um, and as we mentioned this did not work uh, very well. 
How did the EU get involved in this? Well, in addition to the pressure that was already there from the OHR, the EU clearly linked the progress in police reforms uh, to the stabilization and association uh, process. So thus the police reforms as proposed by the Police Reform Commission and the OHR became part of EU conditionality. Shortly after the OHR made a concrete proposal for police reform, uh, the EU conditionality became apparent as EU Enlargement Commissioner Oli Rehn in a letter uh, to uh, the Bosnian leadership required Bosnia to implement the police reform to make progress towards EU membership. So police reform then started to become linked to membership and now you see sort of conditionality and member state building acting almost like traditional EU conditionality in previous enlargements, except it wasn't really like traditional EU conditionality in previous enlargements uh, because none of this would have been happening without the intervention of the high representative. In fact, the October 2005 agreement in which the Serb Republic committed itself to police reform uh, was less due to the success of the EU and more that of conventional pressure by the OHR. So this was not really member state building in that sense. Furthermore, the political crisis uh, in 2007 stalled police reform and efforts at a concrete package of measures to restructure the police. Uh, these were only revitalized in uh, the autumn of 2007 under the then new High Representative Miroslav Lajčak. And um, even then, a first agreement between the Bosnian political parties proved insufficient for the OHR and the Mostar Declaration by the largest Bosnian parties in October 2007 only reaffirmed a general commitment to process. So why was the EU unable to exercise conditionality in the sense of police reform? Uh, first of all, um, the fundamental agreement on this reform uh, was arrived through pressure and coercion rather than genuine commit commitment to reform by political elites. Secondly, police reform followed earlier externally driven reforms um, uh, for change, uh, such as those imposed from the outside, rather than a reform in the context of domestic ownership of reform. And uh, the so-called EU principles became problematic as they required a police structure which by no means reflected a European standard or consensus. Uh, the fact that police uh, would be anchored at the state level uh, actually ran against the experience in many federal states, uh, not least Germany, and also within Britain, um, we have decentralized police forces. So uh, the whole idea that this is actually an EU standard didn't really come, come across very well. And I think the inconsistency in that had a lot to do uh, with the way in which the EU was unable to deliver clarity in terms of conditionality. The defense reform was an entirely different story. Uh, unlike the police reform here, you had much more clarity, but rather than NATO's particular role or power, if you like, to impose conditionality, defense reform's success was more to, uh, due to a number of converging factors. Now, at the end of the war, there were two entity MODs, Ministry of Defense's, two single chains, uh, two chains of command, and two armies. The Federation Republic of Srpska. Uh, and it, it really wasn't much of an urgency at the end of the war to uh, sort of merge uh, these structures into state level institutions. This came about uh, by 2003, basically, when there was an interest uh, from both entities to join the Partnership for Peace initiative. And this happened over a long period of time where the professional armed forces on both entities were actually. Um, uh, exposed, if you like, to Euro-Atlantic structures and NATO procedures through training exercises. And through the military profession, there started to become an interest in PFP. And again, this is something unique to defense reform, which is the, um, the interest of uh, the military professionalism in wanting to join <coughs> certain structures. So that was another thing. But the, uh, I'm running out of time, but um, the, Converging uh, factors, I think, which pushed the success of defense reform were a number of internal and external factors. Firstly, the arrest of Milosevic, which more or less left the Republic of Srpska more isolated than before. Uh, the Serbia's interest under the premiership of Zoran Djindjic uh, to make overtures to joining PFP 
Croatia already having joined PFP, so the Bosnian sort of military elite not wanting to be left behind. Uh, within Bosnia t uh, itself, the time um, of the Alliance for Change government, which came to power in 2000, and they were very supportive of strengthening state-level institutions. So there was a conducive political environment, both internally and regionally, and this had a very strong impact on uh, NATO conditionality. Another impact was the sheer cost of maintaining two entity uh, uh, armed forces. Uh, neither entity was really too thrilled about that. So both of those factors contributed to this growing interest to do some kind of defense reform and hence get involved in partnership for peace. Uh, just like police reform, defense reform was also initiated by the OHR. So uh, unlike, you know, uh, although we say EU police reform, NATO defense reform, just like the EU didn't initiate a police reform, uh, NATO didn't initiate defense reform either. It was initiated by uh, the OHR, more significantly under Patty Ashdown's uh, tenure as uh, HR at the time. Uh, the other important factor is local triggers. Local triggers are very important in uh, getting the progress of reform happening in Bosnia. And in establishing the first defense reform commission in 2003, uh, the trigger was the Orawa affair, which uh, was basically, uh, Orawa was a Serb firm under the contract of the Republic of Srpska Ministry of Defense, which was found to be exporting weapons to Iraq. So that was like the smoking gun that the international community found and said, aha, this is a serious matter. There is lack of accountability because uh, all this stuff is at entity level. And uh, the only way to uh, you know, overcome this, and there is a crisis about this, is to uh, somehow uh, have defense reform. And it's actually uh, very sort of uh, the local triggers. I want to come back to this again in the second Defense Reform Commission, but they're very important in, for the uh, international community to legitimize their plans that have already been laid out and saying, oh, look, this is a matter of urgency. We have to implement it now. And then somehow the local elites acquiesce with that. So somehow crisis, unfortunately, in case of Bosnia, seems to push things forward. Um, so the first Defense Re Reform Com Commission, what they did was they established two chains of command, um, administrative and operational, and the establishment of a single MOD. But the whole administrative side of things were still left at the entities, which meant that the MOD wasn't really strong enough because the entities didn't really want to give stuff to the MOD. And it was decided that it, we, we probably need to move beyond that with a second DRC in 2005, and then you needed a trigger again to set this into motion, and the local trigger for that was the Miladic affair, uh, in which in 2004 a rumor circulated that Miladic worried that he may be handed over to the ICTY uh, as a result of the elections in Serbia, moved from Serbia to the RS and was hiding in military barracks aided by the RS military. Again, this whole notion of accountability uh, at the entity level was presented as a matter of urgency, and hence the Second Defense Reform Commission was set up. What, estab what was um, established with the Second Defense Reform Commission uh, was the complete abolishment of all entity armed forces um, and entity structures and uh, putting everything under one single chain of command uh, and having one entity, uh, one state level ministry of defense. And in this, in, sense, in terms of state building, it actually has been a very successful exercise because you have a functioning uh, state level institution and I've been inside the Bosnian MOD, it really is you know, a functioning state-level institution, which is kind of you know, hard to find uh, in, in Bosnia. And the whole, um, the armed forces were restructured in the form of uh, regiments and uh, based on the British regimental system. And therefore, it, I mean, it has been a success in that er area. Just to sum up, um, it would seem that the success of defense reform is related to a set of converging factors. The skills of the international community key players in wading through ambivalent political attitudes and military resistance to change from old habits. The injection of new blood into the armed forces. The clarity of NATO conditionality and the impact of NATO standards. A conducive local political environment. 
the use of local triggers, triggers which necessitate the urgency of reform as the only problem-solving tool available to tackle a crisis, and the incremental NATO conditions for joining um, PFP. So the success also was that after the second DRC, uh, Bosnia was allowed to join uh, PFP uh, in 2006. But the challenges, and I'm going to wrap up very quickly, I'm going over time a little, um, the challenges that remain is that defense reform, although it was a success, has remained a self-contained exercise. And we really need to see where it, how defense reform will be relevant in future NATO uh, conditionalities, such as the membership action plan, which will have less to do with defense reform and much more political issues. And also defense reform contained the threat of an unmanageable and unaccountable oversized entity MOD forces. And um, the next stage of refor defense reform, which will actually be building capabilities, is not going to be as easy as simply downsizing. And with regards to the EU, uh, the, I think the main problem with police reform was that the EU had been a very reluctant actor in this uh, from the very beginning. And the main differences between NATO and EU in terms of the effectiveness in conditionality can be explained by the fact that NATO had a clear PFP framework, uh, no internal organizational difficulties, and an operational dialogue with the army and security uh, agencies. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you very much. Our final presentation is by Othon Anastaskis of Oxford University, who will speak on the Western Balkans, e-reluctance, local ambivalence, and the need for a European perspective. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to the organizers. And um, my presentation is a way of um, continuing what um, Wade started uh, at the beginning with a wider enlargement context, but specifying this more into the Western Balkan context. And of course, it links with the two previous presentations, um, the regional perspective uh, of initiatives, as well as Gilnir's um, um, state building process uh, um, through conditionality. And it will also act as a bridge, I suppose, uh, with, the, with the other presentations that will come in the next sessions. But I, will, um, I would like to um, emphasize the um, EU current context in terms of how the Western Balkans enlargement is viewed. And um, this is also what Nid asked me to, to, to present. And in fact, when I was um, uh, preparing my presentation, I had in mind what was the context two years ago when uh, uh, I was in the Thessaloniki um, uh, conference and what is the, the climate now, which is in some ways similar, but it also it has evolved uh, in, in, in some other ways. So um, I will um, discuss then the, the current uh, context in, in through three perspectives, basically. The, th the first one is that we see an EU reluctance to, to enlarge. The second one is that we have a, a slow association process between the um, EU and the Western Balkans. And the third one is the ambivalent local politics. And as I said, this is all um, seen through the uh, European perspective. Now, the EU and large uh, uh, reluctance has been a consistent pattern. Uh, in indeed, it started uh, after 2004 with the enlargement and the so-called enlargement fatigue and uh, how the countries managed to uh, grapple with all the difficulties of uh, having uh, 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 10 um, new member states uh, um, and then another two uh, coming, Bulgaria and uh, Romania. And then, of course, there was this whole debate of the constitutional crisis that um, uh, evolved, that was never completely solved, but of course it was overcome uh, through uh, the Treaty of, uh, of Lisbon. There was what we discussed as the qualms over the preparedness of Bulgaria and Romania, uh, in that the European Union never um, uh, uh, sort of came into um, the realization that the two countries were not prepared, but of course there were uh, important security questions that had to be um, uh, that had to be taken into consideration, and the, the the accession of these two countries was a particularly important signal for the rest of the Balkans. And finally, there was the other debate of the EU's absorption capacity and how the EU was able to 
would be able to operate with this big number of uh, new member states. What is the EU side today? We have three major issues that are uh, directly connected with, uh, with the Western Balkans enlargement. The first one is the institutional hurdles and the ratification of the Lisbon Treaty. The second one is to do with the financial crisis and the surge of Western European protectionism. And the third one is bilateral issues. The first one is the institutional hurdles is basically no treaty, no enlargement. <coughs> and uh, although the Western Balkans do not raise a, an identity question in the ways that the Central and East European previous enlargement did for the European Union, or in the way that Turkey does, more in the cultural context uh, in a way, the Western Balkans do um, raise issues that have to do with many institutional concerns, and they have to do with voting, representation in the EU institutions, the small size of the future um, uh, new member states, the addition of six or seven more Western Balkan states, all of them, most of them, um, uh, very small states, in an already overburdened and overwhelmed decision-making process. And because of all this, Sarkozy and, and Merkel have um, very clearly stated that if there's no treaty, there's no enlargement, and that the EU should forget any more members before it resolves the Irish rejection. So the constitutional crisis may have been overcome through the Treaty of Lisbon, but of course, the Irish referendum is still regarded with trepidation. It is expected to take place sometime in the autumn, and the second time is expected to be a yes vote, especially following the promise of the European Union to Ireland that each member state should retain its EU commissioner, and of course, some more guarantees to Irish interests that have to do with taxation and neutral status, um, their abortion issue, and so on and so forth. But having said that, if that doesn't proceed, then there is a real problem. And of course, Croatia can be accommodated through the existing Nice uh, Treaty if there are some um, minor adjustments. But further than that, that creates a big problem. The next issue is the economic crisis. And uh, is it previous one? Sorry. Sorry, I went far ahead. Yes. And here we have a very important matter in that the Western Balkan region, I mean, it took some time for the economic crisis to reach the region, but still now, um, uh, gradually, the, um, the outcomes of this are beginning to, um, to show. One of them, of course, is the uh, foreign direct investment, which is expected, according to the Economist Intelligence Unit, to more than half in 2009, to less than uh, 14 uh, US dollars, billion dollars, compared with almost 30 billion in 2008. Another impact of the economic crisis on the uh, Western Balkan countries is, of course, the remittances, especially countries like Bosnia, Kosovo, Albania, that rely a lot on remittances. That will also have to be uh, cut down. Stock exchanges have been strongly affected by investors. And of course, the EU member, uh, member states' bank investments are also affected in that countries are much more cautious now. And there is this new talk of, um, of protectionism in the um, member states uh, and, of course, their investments in these countries. So we have one side in the European Union of the old member states that are trying to survive, basically, economically, because the crisis had hit them very severely, countries like the UK, uh, Germany, or uh, uh, France, and then, of course, Austria or Greece with important investments in the region. And there is also the other side of the EU with the new member states that are more dependent, in a way, on uh, uh, external uh, uh, bailing out, the IMF, and they are much weaker economies. So in that sense, the EU as a whole is particularly uh, vulnerable to the whole thing. Uh, let alone the Western Balkan countries. So the IMF now comes back into the picture, although there was um, a turn towards the European Union in economic issues, now there is a return of the IMF uh, that um, uh, uh, comes back uh, in Serbia, for instance, where it had to intervene. And then we go to the next issue, which is the bilateral disputes. And that is an interesting development because 
all of a sudden, there are all these bilateral matters between EU member states and uh, candidate or potential candidate countries that arise and, and sort of overwhelm the picture in a way. One of them, which we've already uh, noted, uh, has to do with Slovenia and Croatia on, on the border dispute. And um, while the European Union was preparing to open 10 new chapters with, with Croatia, Slovenia vetoed all but one and slowed down the process of accession. Still, of course, uh, Croatia expects to become a member of the European Union by 2011, but that has slowed down the process. The second uh, very well-known bilateral issue has to do with uh, Greece and FYR Macedonia, and that is to do over the, over the name. And of course, that may not be a direct conditionality or something that um, has affected you know, directly the process of accession, but it is there, it's in the background. It did affect the NATO membership of the country, and in that sense, um, the, that is uh, another bilateral issue that uh, holds back the process. The second, uh, the third one, sorry, it's, no. Going back to the. That's a sensitive machine. The third one has to do with the Netherlands and uh, Serbia, and that is over compliance over the ICTY. And the Netherlands do not want to unfreeze the um, uh, stabilization association agreement with the Serbia unless Mladic is handed over to uh, uh, the uh, court in The Hague. And the fourth bilateral matter is Cyprus and Turkey over the free movement of uh, Republic of Cyprus vessels in the Turkish port. So that is to show that there is this wider climate of ambivalence in the European Union that allows for these bilateral grievances to sort of hold the, um, the process of, uh, uh, of EU accession. And then we go to the EU Western Balkan Stabilization Association process, which, as I said at the beginning, is a slow process. It emphasizes the journey and the intermediate carrots rather than the final outcome, as it did with the previous Central and East European countries. There are different bilateral speeds, and there is also the issue of conditionality with which this process is very closely tied. The EU journey has particular kind of stages which acquire a very important significance in the relationship between the countries and the, uh, the European Union and the Western Balkan countries. There is a conclusion on in the initialing of, a, of the Stabilization Association Agreement. There is the signing of a Stabilization Agreement. There is a ratification process from the, all the countries uh, of the European Union, the granting of the EU candidacy, the start of accession talks, the opening of chapter, the closing of, of, of chapters. All these um, acquire a very special significance in how uh, the European Union views these countries and how these countries views their accession into the European Union. And um, in the course of all this, there are some carrots that are given uh, to these countries. Um, and some of them, or most of them, uh, with a popular appeal, I mean, uh, in order to show that uh, that um, uh, the European Union is um, uh, uh, very popular with the public in the Balkans. So there is the EU financial assistance that go to special issues like infrastructure and that, you know, like they're visible to, to the people. There's a visa free travel or facilitation agreements, which is particularly important for the, um, for the travel of um, Western Balkan citizens to the uh, countries of Europe. There's civil society assistance and there are student exchanges or scholarships. So the EU is trying to, to promote this kind and project this kind of, of image in the region as, being, as facilitating. All this, of course, as I said, is in the context of not giving a final commitment and a final uh, and a kind of committed timetable uh, for accession uh, into the uh, European Union. The other interesting development between the countries and, uh, and the uh, Western Balkan countries and the European Union is that we have different bilateral speeds. Now, that has always been interest with, uh, interesting with uh, the European Union and the Western Balkan countries, and I cannot remember any point in time where all the countries were, or two of them at least, were coinciding in one or on one stage. There's always some difference between the countries, although all of them are interconnected. They're all similar. They started from the same starting point, but all of them are in a, at a different stage in the EU ladder, as it were. So Croatia, which is a more ho hopeful kind of um, uh, case, uh, has started accession talks. It plans to become a member by 2011. Uh, Epoia Macedonia is a candidate country. It has signed the Stabilization Association Agreement, but hasn't started the accession talks yet. 
Montenegro has signed the Stabilization Agreement and has applied for membership in December 2008, despite the reluctance of the European Union, uh, and in fact telling them to do uh, the contrary, not to apply, but they did proceed with it. And of course that was followed by Albania, which also applied in April 2003 or four days ago. Then Bosnia has signed the stabilization and is under an interim agreement before that goes into effect. And Serbia has signed the SAA and its interim agreement uh, has been frozen because of the Netherlands ICTY dispute. Now that is all interesting because these different speeds allow the EU to procrastinate its progress with the Balkans by dealing with each country on its own, on its own merits, and avoiding to have like this package accession process, this package enlargement that it did with um, Central and East European countries, this package enlargement then, it did allow the European Union to cut corners in a way, you know, but now when you have all these different items, uh, all these different small states in, and you have had separate agendas with them, there are all sorts of problems that arise and that of course um, allows the EU to uh, be uh, even more reluctant than what it is. And conditionality is a particularly important aspect of the relationship between the European Union and the Western Balkans. Nothing progresses with them unless yeah, there is a condition that has to be met. And there was the, the, the discussion of, um, of Gunnar was very interesting because it did show the particular challenges and the dilemmas when the European Union is dealing with a difficult case like the defense reform or the police reform, the different um, uh, uh, degrees of success, uh, the differences in consistency, in clarity. I've written a lot about the issue of conditionality and um, I uh, have uh, labeled in a way the use of a pragmatic conditionality uh, in the case of the Western Balkans. Uh, pragmatic which consists of um, criteria that are normative, functional, and at the same time more realistic, more security related. Because security concerns at the end of the day have been always at the background of the relationship between the European Union uh, and the Balkans. And uh, in many ways, like the police reform uh, in Bosnia, the European Union had to tone down its own conditionality, the conditionality that it initially sort of devised and then it had to put to, to uh, tone it down and make it much easier for local actors when it realized that it was leading nowhere or that it was meeting with a lot of resistance. Similarly, um, uh, the European Union had to think of various concerns when it was dealing with Serbia in particular. And although it did pursue a consistent con conditionality in terms of ICTY, it wasn't always consistent in terms of when it was applying its progress with Serbia. So in other words, when for instance there were elections and the European Union wanted to promote the pro-reform um, politicians, uh, although Serbia didn't meet the conditionality with uh, ICTY, still the European Union went ahead and granted the association um, and, and stabilization process to Serbia. So in a way, the main challenges then uh, that uh, the EU faces uh, with, um, with uh, the Western Balkan countries and its conditionality, let me see if I can find them, are to keep the Croatian momentum despite the bilateral uh, difficulties that exist between Slovenia and, uh, and Croatia. Then to keep Bosnia together and uh, avoid the Republika Srpska uh, secession. There are more and more noises now uh, of, for independence coming from, from Dodik and the Republika Srpska politicians and people. To get involved in the Kosovo civilian mission, but without alienating Serbia too much. And finally to retain it's rigid ICTY conditionality for Serbia, but without alienating the pro-European politicians. And I will finish with the third part, because I, most important is that from an EU perspective again, there is this sense that politics in the region are particularly ambivalent, and that there are different national political tra trajectories in these countries, but all of them have their own kind of difficulties and all of them have the, their own kind of ambivalences. And as I said, Croatia may seem the most easy case because of course, even more so because it has a reformed HDZ, its um, uh, previous nationalist Tujman party, which is pursuing accession 
and that makes it a, a, a more interesting case in that there is this kind of, uh, of change in its internal politics. But Serbia continues to be maybe the most difficult case uh, of it all, as it is also central in the region, um, because it is perceived as a country by the European Union which is divided between um, uh, politicians that are pro-European and pro-reform and those that are very nationalist and sort of introvert looking. Um, and in that sense, it always has to, uh, the European Union always has to uh, calculate its strategy towards Serbia by how it operates with these um, uh, two uh, large blocks as it sees. And it, uh, at the core of this, of course, stand the two main challenges with Serbia, the ICTY and the Kosovo challenges. Um, so the European Union in the last year or so, it did contribute a lot to um, the um, uh, electoral outcome. And now there is a pro-reform uh, democratic party that is ruling Serbia. Uh, and at the same time, its opponents, the Democratic Party of Serbia and the Radical Party, um, are, seem to be weakened. Of course, there is always a difficulty in Serbia to attain majorities. And um, in that particular instance also, the, the current government is a coalition with the Socialist Party of, of Milosevic, and that makes the, the kind of um, uh, uh, operation of the government even more difficult. At the same time, with the handing over of Karadzic to the ICTY in um, last summer, uh, we do see, a, 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 and of course one could predict, uh, never of course with certainty, that maybe the government wishes to cooperate fully with ICTY and contribute to um, the handing uh, over of, of um, Mladic. And finally, it's this issue of Kosovo as well, which interestingly, after a year of independence, there hasn't been any major kind of upset. The situation has been rather uh, peaceful. Of course, the Serbian government goes um, around the world and uh, insists on how illegitimate this recognition has been. And at the same time, uh, by taking this issue to the international court they, and legalizing it, they have managed to absorb uh, some of the nationalist shocks uh, within um, the Serbian politics and society. Uh, but having said that, uh, the independence of, of Kosovo and the recognition by most of the European um, Union member states and other countries um, around the world is not solving the problem. And Kosovo is, um, I in itself, a very, very difficult um, uh, country to stabilize and normalize uh, an, an uphill struggle for the European Union. And then it's Bosnia, which is the, uh, the other very difficult case, and that is seen mostly by the European Union through the prism of ethnic politics. It's always been like that, it still is like that, and there's always the dilemma of how long to keep the international administration there. This, this debate keeps on coming to Bosnia, and they keep on, the, the, the after Padi down, there's always the intention that the high representative is going to be the last one, he's going to terminate this, and then they always, in the end, um, uh, prolong this process. So this, there is an international community which is not as active as in the period of, of, of Padi Ashtan, as Gilnes said, but still, they never know when to take the decision of whether of, of um, t whether to give regional ownership to Bosnia or not. And what this regional ownership means at the end of the day, because politics are nationalist and they are ethnic politics in Bosnia, and they are bound to affect um, the course of their um, uh, uh, internal development. So we do see at the moment that there is Republika Srpska that is trying to uh, uh, make the most of uh, its kind of independent and, and, and its kind of uh, uh, um, talk about independence and um, uh, especially taking a um, uh, course from what's happening in Kosovo and at the same time a hardening, uh, a hardening side from the Bosniak uh, Muslim side as well. Albania is a country that doesn't suffer from ethnic politics but of course has bitter internal um, uh, divisions. It's, it's a country that is mostly seen as, as you know, not backward politics exactly but at an underdeveloped level with a lot of client clientelism and um, sometimes unacceptable and democratic um, uh, practices that happen. Yet, as it was o o o um, already mentioned, it is a country that enjoys consensus as far as the, uh, its, its course on, on, on Europe and the West is concerned. Then there is um, FY Macedonia, which, uh, of course, the, the name issue is only part of it. There is uh, always a concern from, from the European Union that this country, um, yet, uh, currently, there are uh, nationalists in power. And also, it's a country that 
it has the most disenchanted people in the Balkans and, and some chronic problems of weak administration and potential divisive uh, ethnic uh, politics. Montenegro is a country that tried to convince the European Union that it's, it is um, a, a, a boring case. And it says that in, you know, in, in, in a way as to convince the EU that it will never create problems. And uh, that may be the case, but of course, in the eyes of the European Union, and many in the West as well, Montenegro fails to explain why it has, has, uh, it has continued to exist so long with this same leadership uh, in fact, as we all know, Djukanovic has been there um, uh, since the beginning. He's the oldest uh, serving uh, political ruler um, in the uh, post-communist Balkans. So just to finish, um, beyond the EU reluctance, um, this regional context is a mosaic of interconnected, uh, yet different national trajectories, which share some uh, common issues, yet they also present their own peculiarities in the course of convergence or divergence from, from the EU. And it still remains a mystery whether the EU, in its approach towards the, towards the Western Balkans, it will go for the individual bilateral approach or it will go for the regional approach in terms of its uh, um, um, uh, future accession. Both courses have their uh, pros and cons, but in the meantime, what is certain is that it continues with this um, uh, slow process, this, you know, this train moving, uh, albeit at a, at a very slow pace. Thank you very much. Well, we have some time for questions. Let me ask that if you're recognized, please wait for the microphone to come. Try and make your question brief and identify the member of the panel to whom it is addressed. Who would like to start? Ross Johnson here. <clears throat> Russ Johnson, the Wilson Center uh, for Dr. Ibet. Thank you very much. Very helpful um, review of the two reforms. Uh, two questions. Um, it's still puzzling, at least to me, how the EU could come up with this concept of police reform, which, as you say, was not is is in no sense EU standard. Certainly not for Germany, least of all for Bavaria. So, um, was this the Commission running amok, or how how did? You know, how did that happen? And then just a question on the uh, process of defense reform. Um, I mean, I'd suggest it was really a question of, of um, uh, dealing with and then consolidating uh, not two structures at the entity level, but actually three armies. And I, I, I wonder if you could, you could comment on that, because it seems to me what, what was there at the, uh, at the, you know, at the Croat Bosnian entity level was wasn't so important as, as compared with the, the, what, what uh, came out of Nate, Dayton as three, uh, three distinct uh, ethnically-based uh, armed forces. Thank you. Shall I well, there, well, take that? You? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Is, is this working? Yeah. Um, with, yes. I mean, uh, why did the EU get involved in police reform? It's, uh, so it was one of those things that uh, was initiated by the OHR. It was a Paddy Ashdown idea. Let's build st uh, state-level institutions uh, by having this police reform commission. And then the EU, by coming in and linking it to the stabilization association process, became directly involved in it um, and then became a very reluctant actor to uh, implement the reforms or actually impose any uh, conditions as such. Uh, and they didn't really have a very coherent approach and they lacked clarity. So I don't think the EU ever really took ownership of the process, unlike NATO. And I think, again, one of the reasons for that, and this really came out in uh, the Sarajevo workshop that we held in December where we were looking at local reactions to both processes and I think from all three sides, uh, all three ethnic groups, everybody said that defense reform really worked not just because it was NATO driven but because it was American driven. So you had in the driving seat one country as opposed to several countries who didn't really quite understand or weren't really that interested in police reform uh, as such. So I think this is where the EU and NATO approaches, the EU is quite disadvantaged in comparison to NATO. It, with regards to defense reform and the three armies, you're absolutely right, I mean, at the end of the war, um, of course, uh, with, with the 2004 agreement, uh, sorry, 1994 agreement, uh, there was, uh, you know, as you know, the federation. So, uh, but it, it, it was a very sort of fragile, 
uh, peace holding the, uh, the, the Muslim and the Croat uh, parties together under the Federation. So that sort of, in a way, merged the two armies together. But at the end of the war, um, there was uh, an American contractor called MPRI, which actually trained uh, the Federation armed forces, so the Bosniak and the Croat forces, uh, under the train and equip program, uh, which was actually in the Dayton Agreement. And I think that sort of merged those two forces together. And so by the time defense reform became an issue, we were really dealing with two forces, the Federation and Republic of Srpska on the other hand. Good, thank you. Robert B. Croft here. <coughs> Bob, you got a microphone coming. Actually, um, more of a comment than anything else. I'd just like to follow up on what Guldner was saying. Uh, my name is Robert Beecroft. I was head of the OSCE mission from in Sarajevo between 01 and 04, and uh, I'm now working for MPRI. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I, two things. First of all, you, uh, it's important to include the role of James Locker in what went right yes. uh, on the defense reform side. Um, and second, I'd just like to put in a word for the OSCE mission because we not only housed James Locker, but we played uh, an essential role, which was also mandated at Dayton, uh, in um, the defense reform process, working very closely with Patty Ashdown. So if defense reform worked right, mm. there were some things that were planned and there were some things that were not. Mm. You mentioned the Arau affair. That was like manna from heaven. Uh, when we discovered that uh, o the Arau company up in Bielina was actually selling inertial guidance systems uh, to Saddam Hussein through the, Sir through the uh, Syrians and also refurbishing jet engines for their uh, MiG-21s. Uh, it was a thank you very much moment. Mm -hmm. And that allowed the NATO and especially the US to put the pressure on Daniel Luca to um, move in the direction of a, a single military. Mm -hmm. Sometimes accidents can be very useful. What, one last point, and this could be a question. We are still dealing throughout the Balkans, and certainly in Bosnia and Herzegovina, with the same old dinosaurs, uh, for the most part, who uh, fought the war and in some cases started the war. Um, as part of the European Union process for the Southeastern Euro European countries generally, how much thought is being given to ways to throw the rascals out. I know that this is theoretically a democratic situation where people vote, but if they are ever gonna make progress, it's by looking at the future and not the past, and they are fixated on the past. Mm -hmm. we won't I think that's another one for you. <laughs> okay, um, w with regards to your comments about the role of James Locker, I mean, I totally agree. Actually, actually, that was in my paper, but I didn't have time to mention that. Uh, and also the OSCE mission. And with regards to the Orao affair coming up, I mean, actually one member of the defense reform told me that basically what you do is you have the plan and you put it in place and then you just sit and wait for something ghastly to happen. <laughs> and because this is Bosnia, something ghastly usually does happen. And then you say, oh, look, I'm so shocked this has happened. But and we have this plan and it's a matter of urgency and we have to enact it. So in that way, and this is unfortunate, this is how crises and local triggers work. With regards to the, um, the EU process, I mean, that's a very uh, interesting question because it, it goes to the heart of this whole issue of this top-down state building and then this sort of um, gently inducing bottom-up state building and local ownership through conditionality. And of course, the two contradict each other and the two exist at the same time in Bosnia to some extent. And uh, what could the EU process do to change, uh, you know, leadership that looks at the past and not forward? Not much, unless you know you continue with the bond powers and say, well, this person is not a very good elected official, so I'm just going to dismiss them. Uh, but I mean, since the Venice Commission report that you know we have to do away with this now, uh, and particularly because the bond powers are in the remit of the OHR and they won't be in the remit of the EUSR. Uh, so the EU cannot have bomb powers, and which is why it comes back to the, you know, uh, Othon's point as well, that, you know, this prolonged process 
of moving from HR to EUSR. I, I don't know when we're going to get there. We, like, you know, you're saying every time we say this is going to be the last high representative, and it never is. And this is one of the reasons, because although the bond powers, to some extent, are no longer valid, you just don't want to let go of them in case uh, you know, want to put them aside for a rainy day. And precisely because you do have elected officials who look backwards, and it's not something you can deal with through conditionality and the soft approach. You know. Can I add something here? Yeah. Please, yeah. yeah. Um, on the issue of uh, old politicians, as you say, this is, this is a very interesting question. And it's also very sensitive on how uh, external actors go about uh, dealing with these um, problems because at the end of the day, these are internal problems. And um, uh, these countries, especially if we compare them with many other states um, around the world, they are democracies. They have regular elections. They do vote for these people, whether we like them or not. And besides, uh, you know, around the whole world, we don't live in an era where politicians are highly regarded anyway. Um, and uh, what I would say about this is that it has to be an internal process. There are limits as to how far the European Union can go in ousting these people. And uh, it's, first of all, it's a democratic process, and that these, either these parties have to be reformed, like we, we see the case of Croatia, which is a very interesting case of a, of a self-informed um, nationalist party, or they have to do something through the elections. The second, of course, uh, um, uh, way to go about this is uh, uh, the legal question. And again, the ICTY can go up to a certain degree. There is also an internal process of justice that has started in Serbia. It has a lot of problems as it uh, is operating at the moment, but it is important there is this kind of internal process of justice as well and reconciliation. So it takes time. One cannot do away with them, with all leaders. Sometimes transitions from authoritarian or nationalism to, to more democratic politics have also to involve these kind of actors, and it cannot happen otherwise. It depends on the cases. Uh, some, may I add something else? Just, to, yeah. just, just briefly, often I couldn't agree more. I also think that just by stating it, uh, stating the possibility that an outside force might actually remove an elected politician, we are strengthening their own position. Uh, I think uh, we should move, uh, we should be distance, distant from those comments. I, if I may also want to ask a question here. Uh, during the introduction of, uh, just before the introduction of the euro, Krugman, uh, the well-known economist, used the Nike expression of just do it. Uh, and I was wondering if the HR packed up and left tonight, they just did it, what will happen tomorrow morning in your view? Because I just think that not many bad things are going to happen. Uh, and I think a lot of people have made a career and a lot of money uh, spending time in Bosnia. <laughs> Do you want me to answer that now? Shall I just respond to that very quickly? If you have a brief response, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, not really. I, I think, you know, the, um, when I spoke to the deputy H HR, he said that we, we should be out of here, you know, within nine months or so. So uh, they, they always say that. But uh, on the other hand, um, you're right, I don't think much would happen, but uh, the, I think the whole process of this transfer HR to EUSR, at least from my impression, that recently has been very much focused on Dodic and what Dodic says and what Dodic's going to do next. And I think, I don't know, I mean, maybe that's another question for everybody else here. I mean, is that a healthy way of looking at things and just focusing on one person? Um, so, yeah. The gentleman in the back here. My name is Bojan Klima. I work for Voice of America, Croatian service. Uh, the question is for two participants who mentioned Croatian-Slovenian border dispute. In your opinion, how is European Union handling this, this issue? And uh, do you see this uh, case b having sort of broader implications? Because one day Croatia might veto Serbia's membership and Serbia's uh, veto in Kosovo and so forth. So, I mean, do they have any kind of leverage or do, are they applying any kind of pressure on Croatia either or Slovenia in this case? Yeah, Wade, well, do you want to start? Well, um, I, don't have, um, I don't have any um, a particular expertise in that exact border dispute, what I think is um, beyond what you read in the newspaper. So what I'd say in general, though, is that I'm struck by um, how incredibly complicated these um, situations can be. I'm thinking recently of uh, France rejoined the military command of NATO 
And I was shocked to see Turkey take a relatively hands-off approach to the re-entry of France to the military command. Um, and I, I, again, don't exactly know why they were so um, relatively open to French re-entry, given the, the difficulty France has created for uh, Erdogan and his party over um, EU enlargement. Um, but this is just an illustration of the fact that these games go on in so many different levels at once that um, uh, you can have a handle on it at T1 and six months later the cards are reshuffled and it looks quite complicated again. But on the Slovenian-Croatian issue, I'm going to uh, defer uh, to, uh, uh, to Othon on that. Um, the EU is generating a dilemma here and it did face this dilemma with um, the uh, Greek-Turkish uh, bilateral uh, border dispute as well, in that um, it, it doesn't want to um, interfere as, as a uh, broad um, um, you know, entity that it is in the bilateral dispute uh, uh, and leaves it to the two um, states to, to solve it. But at the same time, it has to show solidarity to its member state without appearing also to be marginalized the country that wants to become a member state in the future. So that is a particularly difficult and delicate position. And uh, it, it usually advises, recommends, it never puts you know, a, a kind of condition on, um, on, on the accession of a country. Um, it shows some solidarity to, um, as I said, to its member state that uh, has the upper hand in this, but at the same time it, it doesn't want to be too interventionist. So there's not much it can do. It may want to, um, as it did in, in, you know, in the Greek-Turkish case, to say that the two countries have to solve it in a bilateral way and, of course, take the matter into uh, the legal um, uh, international order. The, let's take a final question from the lady here, Elizabeth. Yeah. Thank you, Sue Summers, a former Wilson uh, fellow scholar. Um, this is for both Professor Astenatakis, I hope I pronounced correctly, and um, for Gomer. The qu recently, the Wilson Center hosted Prime Minister Spirich, who was as vocal without any reservation as to the need to effectively evict the internationals from Bosnia, suggesting that if you don't, or if it is not to take place, that there cannot be any real movement forward. He used the term parasitism consistently, which struck a very old accord. And the reference was less to the internationals, but to his own nationals, who he thinks are in a gridlock and cannot move forward because of this consistent paternalistic or almost occupation force, um, which is my, my term, of the Europeans, or, and not just Europeans, excuse me, the internationals. And he, he extended it from the courts all the way through other institutions, but particularly suggesting that the high rep was simply extraneous. Has there been some one-on-one -on -one discussion with this, with, with someone certainly of his, of his status, um, and I was not at the time aware of the, the degree of passion that, that was felt by him. As a Bosnian Serb, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, compared to, let's say, the comments by Dubrovko Lovrenovic last year at the Wilson Center, who suggested that there was no initiative ever taken by any locals. Um, and the, the type, there's a lot of room in between. But if the EU does not actually act more interventionist and allows the gridlock to, re to remain, what do you see as some force that can break it. Because he, he truly was absolutely uh, against the continued presence and uh, influence of the, of the internationals of any strain. It's, it's difficult to judge to what degree, you know, they, they mean what they say. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, clearly, Bosnia is a case of a, a dependent and dependency syndrome. And, uh, w w and of course, the country is also divided, so you don't have a unified voice uh, that feels the same way towards the international community. And uh, even the term international community is quite broad, because uh, at the end of the day, there's going to be, there's bound to be a transition 
um, uh, from uh, the um, uh, high, re high rep to the EU rep. And of course, the European Union is going to take more and more responsibility. And that is already an international intervention in how um, the state is built, how uh, the, um, um, the, the country uh, progresses towards the European Union. Um, but um, I, I think at, 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 the se at, at the current time, the, both the international community and the local community I in Bosnia are quite ambivalent as, as to what exactly they mean uh, and what they would like the role of the international community to be in this country. Some of them uh, want the continuation of Dayton and have a, you know, a, a stronger Republika Srpska. Some of them want a central state, others don't want it. So it's this kind of polyphony within the country that uh, nobody's really clear how exactly they want to continue with it. And there, of course, the role of the international community is particularly uh, important in how it addresses that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, necessarily take the Bosnian position as a unified position towards internationals. Others say that and others say the other, and some of them mean what they say, others don't. <laughs> for instance, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily take Dodik's uh, remarks for independence or for closer sort of um, uh, uh, being part of Serbia, for instance, because the way Dodik is at the moment is in the best position. I mean, he's, you know, he's part of the Republic of Serbia with a very highly autonomous voice uh, in the international world. He couldn't have it better in a way. So <laughs> that's what I mean by it. I mean, it's not exactly clear what... Uh, well, one of the things that came up, on, again, in our workshops when we were looking at um, local uh, reactions was uh, how could uh, organizations like NATO and you who are trying to sort of build member state building through conditionality, not top-down imposition, be understood? Are they really understood? What uh, greater role could the local media do in this sense? And again, there were different um, perspectives on this. Some of the local elites said, well, you know, do we really need to understand everything about the EU? I mean, do the, does the average EU citizen in the EU understand anything about the EU? Uh, you know, so maybe it's better that we, and some people were actually saying in the workshop, maybe it's better that uh, we don't tell them everything about the EU because then they might not want to join. So there were different <coughs> perspectives on that, but I think this sort of, sort of understanding is very important because uh, you're absolutely right that uh, international institutions are still seen very much in the Dayton uh, framework as implementers, imposers, and not necessarily institutions for uh, that one aspires to join. So there, there there's, has to be a shift in perception of institutions. And for example, with NATO, uh, with the defense reform, it was so confined to a narrow technocratic area and the military profession, but in the wider population, uh, it's not clear if NATO's normative side is understood. You know, it's not just a military alliance, it's a security community has values, and none of that is actually conveyed. So. I think going to that is about information, is about you know grassroots and media campaigns. Yeah. Anyone else like Ionis? Any final word or wait? No. Nope. Okay. I would well. I would. I would say very briefly that the European Union has been for a long time caught between two instincts, which was to contain problems from the Balkans, and to Europeanize the Balkans, and it's funny, very, very difficult to run both tracks at the same time, and it's going to have to choose uh, to a certain extent. There are deep contradictions between these two right. kinds of instincts, and these were the instincts that were absolutely at play in the Central European enlargement um, a decade ago. But, um, and I think just the, maybe a last point is that I think that with the economic crisis agreeably hitting um, the region somewhat later, um, there um, going to be forced more and more to make a decision about where they stand. And my own prediction is that the experience of being a small, uh, a small state with a small domestic market, a largely open capital account in a time of fleeing capital with nervous Central European banks looking at servicing their own domestic industries is probably going to make the European Union look like a much bigger and safer boat in some very choppy seas than it has been up to now. So I'm predicting that some of this ambivalence, which is no doubt deep and has good reasons, is going to, is going to on balance, uh, uh, evaporate. And you're going to see somewhat more movement towards the European Union and somewhat more recognition that being a, a small country alone in this current economic environment is not a fun place to be. Well, we're at 
the time when we can have a coffee break. It will be about 10 minutes in length because we're a little bit over. Let me remind you that uh, the line to take away, I think, from this session is that it's not just in Washington where politicians don't always mean what they say. So please join me in thanking this panel. <laughs> <laughs>